when a church grows, it means more people. It's not magic. And how do those people get there? How do those people get to the church so that the church grows and the kingdom is advanced? You know, I remember as a youth pastor, we had uh, a lot of great prayer meetings. And, and if you know me, you know I value prayer. We meet on Tuesday nights. We'll start meeting again soon uh, for just a time of prayer and worship. I value prayer. I think it's essential. I think it moves the heart and hand of God. But sometimes we pray for things that we should just shut up and go do. Put an amen in the chat. I'm going to check later. You see, I remember one night uh, praying. I think it was a Sunday night service. And we were praying for the lost. And it kind of hit me that we were kind of thinking about the lost as this nameless, faceless people group that we had yet to discover, right? Like some hidden tribe somewhere that when we find them, man, we're going to lead them to Jesus. And I remember thinking how absurd that was. Because you know who the lost are? They're your neighbors. They're your co-workers. They're the people at school. They're the people right around you that need you to speak up and share the hope that you have. It's not some group that one day you're just going to discover. God already has you planted right where they're at and is looking to you to reach them. If not you, then who? God has you there. What are you doing? So I remember feeling really challenged by that and just kind of dismayed, really. And it just changed kind of my outlook on things and my preaching, to be honest, and my actions and... and what I do out in the community. Um, And so today, you know, we're going to be talking about this continued theme on community. Uh, We're going to be in chapter 3, but I'm going to look at a little bit of a nuance within chapter 3. You know, everybody has influence. Do you know that? I mean, you may not think so. You may think nobody cares about you, nobody sees you, and I know those feelings can be really overwhelming sometimes, but every single person has influence. It's, in fact, it's estimated that every single person, no matter how introverted or whatever, has influence on at least seven other people. Seven other people that you have influence with. The question then is, what are you doing with that influence? And that's what I want to look at today. Um, so I'm going to go through, and I, like I said, I'm not going to read it. I, don't, I just don't have the, the breath or, or anything, and I'm just trusting that you're going to read it. But in Nehemiah chapter 3, and plus we've already kind of read uh, a lot of this passage, a lot of this chapter, but in this chapter is where you see uh, individuals named that then are working on the wall to build the wall, to repair the wall. And, you, and it goes around and it talks about different sections of the wall and how it's being rebuilt and, and the progress that's happening and it, and it names these people. And so what I want to point out is a couple of examples of the people that are mentioned. Now it starts with Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they repaired a section of the wall right by the temple. And I think that's intentional. And important, I think that men and women of God called to, to serve in ministry, to, called to, to serve by leading, um, I think it's important that they model what they preach. Do you believe that? Haven't we had enough hypocrisy? I think it's important that we see the men and women commissioned by God leading the way. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do 
There's roles in the kingdom of God. We can't do everything, but as much as is able. And, you know, of course, we have the, the uh, model in the, the Acts where, you know, the, the deacons were commissioned and, you know, it's not right that we neglect the word of God to clean tables and so on. Those principles are true. Uh, but I, I think it's important that the heart and character and when it's time, when everybody needs to get to work, that that modeling is there. I hope that you believe that with me. And then we go on and we read about different groups, groupings of people, the sons of uh, Hassaniah. Uh, so we have families that are on the wall. We have the uh, Tekoites. Uh, they repaired sections of the wall. And then there's a real indictment statement in this passage where it says, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. Do you remember the example I just mentioned about Elisha and the priest? Here we have the contrary example to where the nobles, the ones with titles, the ones with leadership positions, would they forgot they are servants first. They would not stoop to serve the Lord. What an eternal indictment upon those nobles in the Word of God. And then there are those mentioned more than once, like Elisha, the high priest, is also mentioned again later on as doing work on different areas. So he didn't just do one area, he meant, he's mentioned later on as, and repairing another area. And so, and the, or there's a, the man called uh, Baruch in uh, verse 20 that I think is worth highlighting in front of you this morning. I believe we have the verse, Nehemiah 3.20. It says, next to him was Baruch, the son of Zabai, who zealously repaired an additional section. I don't know what's in front of you, and I don't, I, you know, we have things to do around here. We have the work of the kingdom of God. But here we see somebody doing hard work, dirty work, who is doing it zealously for the kingdom of God. Is Jesus enough for you to work hard and do it zealously? Do you have a picture of him that will drive you beyond just grudgingly doing things. Oh, well, we need another volunteer in the nursery. I guess I'll do it. Zealously doing the work of the kingdom. Hey, pastor, whatever you need, I'm here. I'm, I'm here to serve. Whatever I can do to advance the kingdom of God and the mission of this church, pastor, I'm here. I'm praying for you. I'm here. Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm here. Man, I need more of that. You know, there are those who, are, who mentioned like the Tukoite num, uh, nobles who were too prideful and self-consumed to do the work of the Lord. But here's Baruch who zealously repaired an additional uh, a section. And what I get from this is this. The point is that God notices your heart. He's watching. He sees us, doesn't he? And there are always, listen, in the church, there are always those who will do more than others. I'm not telling you a secret, am I? There are those who will choose to do less, yet enjoy the benefits of those who work harder. And no, it's not fair. But life isn't fair. And why, why would you consume yourself by comparing yourself to somebody else? Just be like Baruch, who zealously did what was in front of him to do. Because we can't let bitterness and comparison enter into our hearts. God is a God of justice, and all will be exposed in the end as everyone stands before him. Don't worry about it zealously do what's in front of you to do. Amen? Amen. All right, thank you. I need you, I need you like triple time today because you, you're it. <laughs> and then we read about the men of Gibeon and Mizpah and the seed, uh, you know, the seed of the governor of the province beyond the river. We see groupings, people outside of the immediate community who are there to help. Uh, in verse 8, uh, Nehemiah ver, uh, chapter 3, verse 8, um, Uziel, the son of Han uh, uh, Harhiah, uh, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. Next section of what? 
the wall, right? What is he? He's a goldsmith. He repaired the next section, and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. And then we read about rulers of half districts of the city. We read about inhabitants of Zenoa. We read about temple servants who were there on the wall. We see people from all distinctions and classes and backgrounds all laboring together to get the work of the Lord done. And then, and finally, in verse 32, we read this. The other goldsmiths and merchants repaired the wall from that corner to the sheep gate. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Father, I thank you. I thank you for the technology today where we can gather together Even if it's virtual, it's not the same. It's not as good. But God, we're gathered together on your day to worship and to hear your word. God, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with the the Ruach HaKadosh, the breath of God. Enable me, God, to speak. Put your words in my mouth, your spirit within me and your anointing upon me. God, I believe that you have a word for us today. I pray that wherever anybody is watching this, whether it's live right now, or whether it's watched later as a recording, that you would arrest their hearts and speak a word directly to them. Surround us, O God. You are our hedge. You are our shield those that are struggling with sickness of various types and recoveries, I ask for grace. You are the Lord, our healer. That's in Jesus' name. Amen. So, can I tell you what I see in this chapter? Yes? Good. I see progress. Uh, I see a community of faith that is focused, that is motivated, and that is willing to work. But I've mentioned those already. What I believe the Lord showed me and wants me to talk to you about today is a different layer of that. You see, what I see in this chapter for today is not only the overall community of the post-exilic Jews who had returned from captivity, who were working on the wall, but what I see in this passage today is also the smaller connected communities that were a part of the whole, the smaller connected communities that were a part of the greater community known as the Jews. Did you, did you catch it as I was reading those distinctions? We've got priests, we've got groups of family members, we've got rulers, we've got servants, we've got rural, we've got metro, we've got community leaders and professionals We've got blue-collar industrial workers. We've got farmers. We've got commuters. We've got students. We have specialized craftsmen and skilled tradesmen. We have businessmen. You know, goldsmiths and perfume makers are swinging hammers and hauling dirt. We've got butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. We've got all these groups, smaller bits of community that are working as part of the greater community. You see, Nehemiah came with the mandate in the favor of the king. He put forth the call and the vision, and the people responded. But it is, it's within that response that I want to focus today. You see, each name mentioned and each grouping of people was a smaller community within the whole. In order for those people to have shown up to work, it required somebody with influence in their circle to issue the call to work. Nehemiah came and he pitched the the vision and the idea and the news to the nobles and the leaders 
And then the leaders and nobles and all of them and all the other people who had influence in their own circles went and repeated the call and called them to the work. He, Nehemiah issued a general call, but it was up to the people who held influence within the smaller circles to echo that call and recruit their people to join them on the wall. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying about it wasn't just Nehemiah coming and shouting from the, the side, saying, hey, do this. He gave the vision and the call, and then the, the leaders within the community echoed that call, used their influence to then bring their people alongside to do the work. Nehemiah didn't go around recruiting every single person that showed up to do the work. He relied on people who already had influence in the community to exercise their influence to rally the people to come to work. Do you know that there is an absolute war upon you straight from the pit of hell to keep you living a small, ineffective, isolated life. Do you know that? It's more than ever. Do you also know that there is also a natural drift towards isolation in our lives that happens? You know, students complain about school. It's kind of their job. And, uh, you know, they complain about being made to do this and go to school, and blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm hoping that with this whole crazy 2020 stuff, they're valuing community a little bit more. But um, there's something that we lose as adults. You see, our young people are forced into community. And they might complain about it, and there might be super weird dudes and whatever, and there's bullying, and there's all kinds of challenges because people are people, and people are broken. But there's a, there's a benefit and a blessing because of community, of feeling connected. And once you're done with school, you, you can be, you, it's natural for older folks, older folks to begin to drift towards isolation, and it's so incredibly unhealthy. And with technology today, it makes it easier and easier for us to just drift apart. And why do you think so many people are struggling with depression and isolation and suicide? Because they feel like they're not seen, they're not heard, they're not connected, they're not loved, they're not part of a community. And so just like the natural inclination within our flesh to drift away from God and to drift towards sin with this natural drift towards isolation, we have to fight that and push back. It doesn't just happen. If another shutdown comes, as people are talking about, it's going to be, people are going to be in real trouble. Not only about jobs, struggling single moms, trying to provide servers, bartenders, just, just trying to work, just trying to provide, um, they don't get paid. But not just jobs, but there's, there's a re we have the data, right? We've done this. We have the data. Depression, up. Suicides, up. Abuse, up. Substance abuse, up. We're not made for that. There's a reason why in our prisons the worst form of punishment is what? Solitary. When we're isolated, our spirits begin to die. You know, everything we know about Scripture and our mission in this world is rooted in advancing the kingdom. Advancing the kingdom. We're called, each and every one of us, to go into all the world. Go. Go. Not stay. Not pull back. Not retreat. But go. And yet everything, 
everything in our world right now is geared towards you sitting down, shutting up, and saying absolutely nothing about Jesus, and stay in your little hole. You know, you can talk politics, you can talk spirituality, you can talk religion, but the moment you bring up the biblical Jesus, there is immediate tension and immediate pushback. And I see Christians caving to the drift to isolation and retreatism. And I see Christians living such small lives, overcome with addictions, distractions, excuses, anything but the abundant life of influence in this world that we are called to live as we advance the kingdom and go into all the world. There's a disconnect between what we are told to expect as a Christ follower in Scripture and what we are seeing in this world right now. Do you feel scared and isolated? Listen, I know that we are living in some challenging times right now. Nobody's denying that. You know the stuff I'm coming through and still trying to come through right now. Nobody's denying that. I'm here on a Sunday morning with a mostly empty building because this crazy pestilence that's been released on the world. I understand that. But I'm talking in general. You know, we... we We are living in some challenging times right now, but greater is He who is in us than He who is in the world. Now is the time while everybody else is running away for the church to rise in advance. Listen, I recognize the season that we are in, right? The season. It's a season. You know, we we live in the north, right? We're men of the north. And I know that winter is coming. (laughs) Did you catch that? But I know that even in the middle of winter, what looks like inactivity on the surface is just covering the fact that the roots are digging deeper and deeper into life. We know that. We understand seasons. Just because it looks like no, there's no movement doesn't mean that God is not active. God began something here August 2nd, 2020. In the middle of the craziest year I can ever remember. God began something here at Creekside. You know, what a contrast. I talked to two women recently, um, two different conversations, two radically different conversations. One was freaked out about the times we're living in and so on and so so forth. What do I do? What do I do? I said, listen, my counsel to you has not changed in 10 years. Get involved in a local church with accountable, loving relationships. Learn more about God. And start that you, there's nothing else I can tell you until you start obeying God. And you know, oh, COVID, this, like, listen, you've been paralyzed by fear way before COVID showed up. It's just the latest excuse. And then I was talking to a wonderful, spirit filled woman this week about my recent fight with COVID. And she said something that stuck with me. She said that the enemy tried to rip out by the roots this new work that God has begun here at Creekside, but he failed. You see, the enemy knows you strike the sheep and the or strike the shepherd and the sheep scatter. That's scripture. You know, there's a I I believe there's a reason why um, I got hit with this COVID thing harder, as far as my knowledge. Uh, harder than anybody else in the church. It literally almost took me out. I believe there's a point to that. I believe that there was a strategy to that. 
But the enemy was trying to uproot what God has begun. And, but you see, we're talking about a different kind of seed. It's, it's a kingdom seed. You see, 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of God was established a, a beachhead in a massive rescue operation that was initiated all the way back in the Garden of Eden where our first parents rebelled against God. And, and 2,000 years ago, with the death, burial, and resurrection of the, and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the seed of the kingdom took root. And it was so small and fragile, you know, 11 knuckleheads, you know, rejecting God, running away, denying Jesus. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit shows up. 3,000 people get saved in a day. And that's not a whole lot compared to the world. But from that fragile, small beginning, the world was changed. That's the kind of seed we're dealing with around here. It's kingdom seed. It was tiny and weak, yet it was filled with the infinite will and resource of a father trying to reach his children. That's the seed that's planted here. And by his will and by his word, it will happen and it will spread. But it is not without your active participation that it will happen. We do not serve fate. We serve a God who calls us to believe on Him and trust His promises and do the work to put our faith into action. That's the God we serve. So the call this morning is for you to increase your influence. That's what we see in our passage. That's what we see happening is the influence of local smaller groups upon one another to respond to the overall general call. Where you want to pull back, push forward. Where you want to retreat, advance. Where you want to isolate, push forward and make new connections with people. Where you want to become a cat lady. Get out of the house. Go talk to people. But listen, I need your help. I need your help. Does anyone doubt my commitment to Jesus? Does anyone doubt my commitment to His kingdom? Or to Creekside Church? Have you been paying attention? Have you seen what my journey has been like from the very start, even up till now? Do you doubt my commitment to you, to this church, to the mission? I hope not. If so, you're not paying attention. I need your help. And in order for that to happen, I need you to start seeing things differently. I need you to put on a new pair of glasses. Your prescription's wrong. I need you to get it adjusted. Creekside is an umbrella. Okay? It's a covering under which you need to begin to grow and you need to begin to build your influence within the surrounding community. This is not a refuge to come and hide. Do you hear me? We're not coming here to hide from the world. We're coming here to be equipped so that we can engage the world around us. This is going to be a launching pad for leaders and missionaries and young people called into the ministry. That doesn't happen without a new set of glasses. We need to see ourselves as kingdom agents out in the world rather than scared little refugees. I can't wait till church on Sunday. Get back in the presence of God. Listen. Greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world. And you need to start acting like that's true. Are you a student? You need to understand that you don't just go to school. You are sent to school. And you are sent by the Holy Spirit. God is, do you know Jesus? And you're a student. God is counting on you to not shut up, not sit down, not deny Him, and not be quiet. Now, I'm not saying you jump on the lunch table and start preaching. 
Although if that happens, I want video. But you need to begin to grow your influence and not bow to the pressure and the idols of this world. God wants to invade your school, and He's sending you in there to do it. Grow your influence for the kingdom of God. Are you a craftsman? You need to understand that God has given you the ability uh, not just to create and to provide for your family, but to apply that skill to advance the kingdom of God. We have a value around here that you can't outgive God. Now, we're not prosperity gospel people. You know, if you write a big fat check to the church, you're going to get a Ferrari. Okay? We don't believe that. I mean, I kind of believe you should write a big fat church to the check, or church, check to the church. But, uh, but what I'm saying is this. The principle is this. You can't outgive God. You can't match His generous heart. When you give to God your time, your talent, your treasure, He multiplies it back to you in so many different ways where you'll just be blessed. You'll be blessed. God has given you breath and ability. You say, ah, I worked hard. I trained for that. Did you bring yourself into this world? Did you give yourself ten fingers, ten toes, arms, and legs? God has gifted you. Celebrate your excellence and your craftsmanship. That's awesome. That's great. But understand that God requires account for every good and perfect gift that He gives us. And we are to give it all to the kingdom of God. And then He just blesses us like crazy back. Are you a businessman? Are you gifted in the ability to make money? Awesome. Most of us are just gifted in the ability to spend money. But, you know, do you understand that you can gain the whole world and yet lose your soul? Do you understand that the endless pursuit of profit will never satisfy? There is nothing wrong with being rich. Hear me. Because of this garbage in our culture right now. There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with having money. Nothing. But if it is your God, then it is an idol, and you need to repent. It's if, God, if God has give, gifted you with the ability to make money, it's just like any other gift that we'll all give account before God one day. Listen, I have, I have set plans in motion based on God's prophetic direction and His calling for this church, but I need your help. More than all of that, I need you to grow your influence. I need you to invest in your growth and yourself. I need you to not be content. I need you to to resource yourself and grow your influence. I will be investing in your growth around here in various ways, whether it's on Sundays or different uh, teachings, leadership, training, development, and so on. I'll be investing in your growth. You will be equipped for growth, leadership, and a life that's lived on mission. If your goal, though, is to, around here is to live a small, ineffective life, lived in fear and seclusion, you're going to hate it around here. You're, gonna, you're never going to feel an ounce of comfort. Because I'm going to be pushing you to grow your influence. Well, I'm an introvert. I don't care. Everybody has influence. Grow it. Invest in it. Use it for the kingdom of God. If your goal is to pursue being the most right at all times, who would rather have their intellect tickled each week while doing absolutely nothing to advance the kingdom of God and just you want to turn into the frozen chosen who never get down into the dirt with people who are just trying to figure this life out, then you're going to be pretty uncomfortable as well. 
And you see, the frozen chosen, they spend so much time making sure things are right, but they don't do anything. And if you do something they don't think is right, they're going to let you know. But they haven't talked to a lost person in 15, 20 years. They're not showing kindness to their neighbors. They're not reaching out. They're not sacrificing financially and with their time and their, their talent. But they're ready to tell you how you're doing things wrong. Somebody's preaching this morning. Am I right, Sherry? <laughs> I got to I gotta get some feedback. Okay. You know, these people, they worry more about politics, tattoos, carpet color, how the next generation is ruining everything. They worry about that rather than stripping down to their tidy whities grabbing a servant's bowl, and washing feet like our Lord did. They're like the, the Tekoa nobles who were too proud to bow themselves to the work of the Lord. Are you feeling depressed? A lot of people are. I, wanna know, I want you to know this. The past month, as I've wrestled with this COVID thing, it's unlike any other sickness that I've ever experienced. Of course, there's the physical stuff, but it hit me in my spirit and in my mental health so that every day has been a battle. And if you don't fight back, you will be overcome. And if you isolate yourself, you will be overcome. If you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling isolated, if you're having a mental health, health battle, there's one thing that I can tell you that I've done that has helped me time and time again. It's get out and go serve somebody. You know, there's some concerns with COVID and all that stuff, but go visit a nursing home. Spend some time with somebody who's alone. Go find somebody worse off than you and just begin to pour into their life value and blessing and encouragement. And before you know it, not only are they blessed, but you're blessed too. Go serve somebody. Get out. Stop being isolated. It makes everything worse. I'm convinced that the enemy is directing all of his energy into isolating the people of God. But I need you to fight back. I need you to grow your influence in the community around you. You know, if it had not been for the influencers within Jerusalem who responded to Nehemiah and then added their own influence as they echoed his call, the work of God would have failed. There was just too much opposition. But because the people embraced the risk of rejection, the risk of failure, and even the risk of a loss of influence that they were attempting to use for good and for the kingdom, they were risking it if the people would have pushed back and said no. They risked it, and it didn't fail. Risk. Put yourself out there. It's scary, I know. You know, most people don't understand what resides within them as a Christian. You don't understand that you're a child of the King. You don't understand that you're a daughter or son of the Most High. You don't understand that you've been adopted into sonship and daughtership with, with the King. You don't understand the forces that are around you. Like Elijah who opened up the, prayed and opened up the servant's eyes and he saw the army of God encamped around the enemy. You don't understand you think you're focusing on all the news and the darkness and the confusion and all the just the toxic speech and ideologies out there. You don't understand what's arrayed for you and what's in you. You say, what can I do? I'm so small and broken and messed up. Listen, do you have a story? Do you have a story? 
Everybody has a story. If you're a Christian, you have a story. You know, in my devos yesterday, in, uh, I was in uh, 1 John, reading the chapter of 1 John, uh, not 1 John, sorry, John chapter 9. And uh, the essence of it, I'm not going to read it to you, but the essence of it was this. Jesus healed a man who was born blind. And the Pharisees were ticked at him again, which is awesome. I love ticking off Pharisees. They're still around, by the way. Um, and so the Pharisees were ticked again. And so they called this man who had never seen in his life, who's in the middle of being like, seeing literally for the first time ever. And they called him in front of him to testify. And he's getting to see a bunch of angry Pharisee faces. I don't know if that's the first thing I would want to be looking at. But so this man was called before them to testify. And they were asking him a bunch of theological questions. His response is something that I think can help you. He, said, he basically said this, listen, I don't know about all that. I don't know about all that. That's supposed to be you guys' job. I don't have all those answers. But one thing I do know, I've been shown grace, and it's amazing. You see, I once was blind. But now I see. Every one of us have that story. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the... Uh, there's a study and a degree and apologetics and, and, and just different things. You have a story. Share it. In the end of the book, right, we read how he, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. It's enough. So I want to close with this. You know, we're going to get back to doing lunches um, after services as soon as we can, as soon as it makes sense. But I've been meeting with groups of people from the church, trying to get to know them after Sunday morning services. And we, we have a quick lunch, and for an hour I get to know them, and I hear their stories. And I ask questions about, hey, how did you wind up here at Creekside? And, you know, tell me your story. And, and so I've, 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 I truly treasured each of those, and I hope to get back to those as soon as we can. But um, I heard a lot of great stories about how people call this place home. And uh, something that struck me is everybody is here because of somebody else. You know that? I didn't hear one exception to that rule. Everybody that calls Creekside Church their home is here because of somebody else. Somebody inviting them. Somebody chasing them. Somebody being super annoying and continually inviting them, even if they keep saying no, 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 no. Everybody is here because of another person like that. And somewhere along the line, the people that call this church home, it went from being that person's church who invited me to come and got me here, somewhere it went from their church to my church, their community to my community. And what I'm telling you today is it is on you to reproduce that and get other people here. Because this is the place where God is lifted up. The, the world can make sense. The people of God worship. We're in His presence. People experience God. I still want you building community outside of this place. I want you in increasing your influence. But the goal is always to begin to draw people to God. And if you're not comfortable talking to them directly about the Lord, then at minimum, invite them to church. Invite them to church. You got here somehow. You have to pass that on. It's not supposed to stop with you. That's not how the kingdom of God works.
I want you to build communities. I'm already hearing stories about how, um, I think it was Katie Beth telling me that how she's started meeting with uh, a, a group of 20-something girls and just trying to build some community and build. That's awesome. More of that, please. More of it. We need all kinds of those little communities under the umbrella of Creekside as God begins to move and advance. So uh, let me give you a couple of action points, and then we're done. Okay? Um, you know, we, we're kind of separated, and things have slowed down a little bit because of all the COVID stuff. This is a perfect time. This is the season. It's a perfect time to talk to the Lord and dream about what He is calling you to do. Turn the news off. Put the phone down. Turn off all the devices. And then spend some quiet time with Jesus and invite Him. Literally say, Lord, I invite you to come spend time with me. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I welcome you to come and speak to me. Spend time with me. And just begin to just sit in His presence. And then if it helps you or you need it, man, put some worship jams on. You know, whatever floats your boat. I mean, if you want to slap in a little Gaither Homecoming VCR tape into there and crank that bad boy, you go ahead and do that. I'm going to choose something a little different, but that's fine. You know, I'm going to put some Elevation Worship on or, or some Madison Street Worship with my boy Corey Voss. Or there's, there's so many great options, but I put on worship and I just saturate the atmosphere with worship. And God, just come, just come, just come. Ask the Lord to fill you with His Holy Spirit. Do you know there's more? Everything that you have experienced in the past, there is more. God wants to fill you and use you. He wants to give you uh, gifts in the Holy Spirit. He wants to fill you with His Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord to speak to you and then then act on what He says. Is there somebody that He's trying to lay on your heart? during that moment. Reach out to them. Even if you haven't talked to them in decades, reach out to them. Pray with them. Connect with them. Build community. Do you need to adjust your career and your life goals to make the kingdom of God a priority? Do it. You can't outgive God. How can you make more connections instead of less? And again, At minimum, you need to be inviting people to church. There's been a constant prayer that I've been praying for Creekside for over a year now. Say, well, hold up. We haven't been talking to you for a year. Yeah, I know, but but before I even knew this place and the possibilities... I've been asking God to go before me and build the team. I'm not a one-man show. Don't want to be, ever. I'm a team builder. And right now, I need your help. I'm asking God to build the team. I'm asking that as this message is going forward, that God is speaking to some people's hearts about building the team around here and building the community and, and be... Nehemiah builders who can see by faith what only looks like small things right now, or even rubble. I'm asking God to build the team. I'm asking Him to issue a call to people's hearts that will get them here, even if they don't even live locally. I'm asking God to build the team. I'm asking Him to build the team that will fulfill what He has spoken about what must happen moving forward. I'm asking Him. And I'm asking you to do your part. Invest in your influence. Begin to dream with God. The best days are ahead. The best days are ahead. And I know it looks dark right now, but listen, remember? We're people of the north. We get seasons. The roots are digging down. We're getting stronger. We're pushing towards more life. It's good. Don't get discouraged. Don't get isolated. Don't allow depression to take root. Fight back. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that your word has gone forward 
with technology and even into the heavenlies. God, I thank you that the words that have been spoken this morning are, are echoing throughout the Council Bluffs, Omaha area, as you hear and you issue commands concerning your word. You have all authority. God, there's nothing that the enemy can plan that will stop it. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Father, I thank you that you're in the middle of all this, and we're not alone. Help us to press deeper into you. Jesus, we love you. I'm praying that you would come and walk these hallways as we see children being trained and raised up, as we see youth coming out of brokenness and addictions, finding hope and truth that sets them free. I'm praying that you walk these hallways and in this sanctuary where we gather together to worship you, lift you up as you set people free, as you bring new hope, new life. God, I thank you that next year we're going to see multiple services because you're going to bring your word to pass. I see it. I see it. We know that faith is the evidence of things not seen. I see it. And I stand upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. See you on next Sunday.